Hey guys, welcome, welcome, welcome. May the Father be glorified. May the Lord Jesus, the Father, Son be glorified. May the Holy Spirit be glorified in Jesus' name. <clears throat> I'm going to pray in a minute. But we'll begin in Jesus' name. Yes, Razzles, that's what it means. When I get attacked, that means Satan is upset. So glory to Jesus Christ. But Razzel, instead of fighting with me, debating with me, Razzles, or starting side debates on issues that are not salvific, help me, Razzles. Now you're Chaldean, meaning you're a Syrian. Syrian Chaldean were one. Help me. Work with me. Pray for me. And John, just let me share with something with you, brother. Okay. John, my precious brother, you said, guys, pray God sends me someone soon. Folks, this is something serious. Our brother John just opened his heart to us. There are many young men and women that burn with passion. And I confess, as a brother in Jesus Christ, I too burn with passion. So pray the Lord Jesus. Guys, pray for each other. Pray for each other. Pray the Lord Jesus keeps us pure sexually, not to defile ourselves with things that we shouldn't be watching. And if we fail, may he save us and have mercy on us. Not to touch any woman if you're a man or any man if you're a woman before sex, uh, sorry, before marriage. In Jesus' name, the Lord Jesus save us from fornication, from premarital sex. And if the Lord Jesus desires for us not to burn, but to marry, to f to find that godly spouse and not rush into marriage, but be patient on the Lord. And if God is pleased that he wants us to be single, to then by the power of the Holy Spirit, crucify our passions and give us victory over them. Pray, because that is a struggle. I know married folks that struggle. I know single brothers that struggle, right? And I'm one who struggles too. That's one of my weaknesses in my my <clears throat> struggles is my passion. I burn. So pray for me. If you love me for the sake of Jesus and you believe that I'm a servant of Jesus, use of the spirit. No, I am human. I'm not superhuman. And I have my own issues and sins and struggles. Pray the Lord Jesus will purify me. Give me victory. And if he wants me to be celibate, to help me die to these passions, or if he is pleased to have a godly woman, share her life with me to serve Jesus until the Lord returns or calls me home, then pray for that, right? So pray for John. He just opened that up. Yep, Christ away from Pell Talk. What's up, Chris Claus? Welcome, everyone. We need your prayers. Yeah, yes. Real quickly, let me answer this question real quickly. <clears throat> I'm a little later than normal. I would like to start around 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time because that's a perfect time. 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, it's perfect because people in UK, it's not too late for them. But today I was a little later than usual because Satan again tried to discourage me, make me fall into depression and succumb. But glory to Jesus Christ and his love and mercy and his patience with me. I got back up by the power of the Holy Spirit. So I asked the Lord Jesus to cleanse me of my filth, cleanse me of my f flesh, give me victory to crucify my flesh and have mercy and wash me in the blood of the Lord Jesus. Wash us in the blood of the Lord Jesus. The blood of the Lamb cleanse us and purify us. We love you, Lord Jesus. Take over this session and anoint my mouth to speak truth without error. And recall the scriptures. And Lord Jesus, we ask for this grace. Not just to know the word, but to live it perfectly. Live it with the power and the zeal and the passion from your beautiful Holy Spirit. To be more like you, Lord Jesus. To crucify the world <clears throat> to ourselves by your Holy Spirit. And Lord Jesus, have mercy on us when we fail. And take over, Lord Jesus. Anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to your servants, Lord Jesus, please. And fill my lungs and my chest and throat with the breath of life, the health I need to speak for your glory, to speak about your glory, to use my mouth to glorify you, praise you, never to use it to sin, and use my body to glorify you, offering it as a sacrifice. And I pray that for all these brothers and sisters, Lord Jesus. Fill them with the Spirit. Fill them with the Spirit, Lord Jesus, to use their mouths to glorify you, not to sin, and their bodies to glorify you, not to use their bodies to sin against you, Lord Jesus. You know our needs and our weaknesses and our shortcomings, Lord Jesus. Save us from Satan, from his children, from this corrupt judicial political system. Save us from our own sinful passions and help us to love you perfectly and love each other, to be doers of your word, Lord Jesus. Please help us. Help me in that area. 
and bless this session, Lord, and bring them, Lord. Bring them in droves. They're not here for me. They, they believe that you will use me to glorify you. They're here for you because they love you. And, Lord, illuminate us to dig into the depth of Scripture, to, to just <clears throat> pour into Scripture, bring out the meat of Scripture, to feast at your table, Lord Jesus. Feed us, Lord Jesus, spiritually, and feed us emotionally, and feed us <clears throat> psychologically and physically, Lord Jesus. And again, Lord, make the sound of my voice pleasing to their ears, Lord Jesus, because it's not about me. May I decrease, you increase, increase, Lord Jesus, increase, Son of God, for your glory and save us from error. In Jesus' name, we love you, Lord Jesus. We worship you, Son of God. And help me not to be a distraction and a nuisance to my neighbors, but bless them too through the preaching for your glory, Lord Jesus. Cover us by your blood and forgive me, Lord, for failing you. Forgive me, Lord. Not to be a hypocrite, but a doer of your word in Jesus' name. Yahweh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We love you, Bobby. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Okay. Yes, there is one thing I want to answer before I begin. <clears throat> first and foremost, first and foremost, all right. You've heard about the home going of Ravi Zacharias. Folks, I'm going to try to set a schedule where I'll be doing my streams around 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Things came up, and so I'm a little later, but always remember, unless the Lord Jesus decides otherwise, <clears throat> expect me to be live streaming at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's New York time, because that's a perfect time for people in America and in Europe. Now, you guys have heard about Ravi Zacharias' home going. Now, don't forget, folks, the man was 74 years old. The Lord Jesus was pleased to bless him with a full life, meaning if you live in your 70s, that's pretty much a full life, right? Let me show you something. The mods here. Sorry about that. I don't want to spill my coffee in my shirt. And I'll tell you why I'm wearing a Coke shirt. Mods, you here? The ones who post verses for me? Who's here? Are they here or no? I like to buy the world a Coke. I guess the mods are not here. Hey, the guys that post verses for me are not here. Okay, Riaz is here. Thank you, brother. Riaz, post Psalm 90, verses 11 to 12. Ontologics. You're going to start this again, dude? Oh, Protestant is here. Riaz, it's not I like Protestant more than you. He's older than you. He's your spiritual senior. So we have to give him respect because, remember, he was there during the days of Moses. He was actually there when he saw them build the pyramid. Okay, now, Psalm 90, verses 11 and 12. <clears throat> Read with me. Psalm 90, verses 11 and 12. Thank the Lord Jesus for our brothers and sisters serving me to serve you. Okay, watch here. Who knoweth the power of thine anger? Look look what the psalmist is saying. He's saying, who can fathom the power of your anger? When you get angry, who can understand the great destruction that you can inflict upon those that you're angry with? Who can understand how dangerous it is to get you angry? Because if you're angry, there is no power creation that can stop you from pouring out your wrath because you are almighty. Okay? Even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. Now notice what he says in verse 12. Right? So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Did you catch it? Wisdom. Now, what's the point? We know we are not going to live forever in these bodies and that either we will die or the Lord Jesus descends. If he descends, if we're believers, then he transforms our bodies to become deathless and our bodies become physically indestructible and we become morally incorruptible where we cannot sin anymore because he's all powerful and he'll transform us. Right, But until that happens, we're going to die. Ravi is 74 years old. The Lord Jesus was pleased to give him those years to serve him mightily. Okay. He's now entered glory. If you believe the Bible, <clears throat> folks, if you believe the Bible and you believe Jesus is risen, Ravi has now been made whole. He is cancer-free. He is pain-free. He's perfectly healed. If you believe the Bible, his soul, his spirit left his body. And that moment he entered the heavenly presence of Jesus. And now in that spiritual 
shape and that spiritual body that he has, that spiritual form that left his body. He's conscious, he's alive, and he's beholding the glorified physical body of Jesus. And he's beholding the myriads of angels. And he's beholding other believers who have died before him, died in Jesus Christ, young and old, who are also there as spirits but spirits that have a spiritual shape by which they can recognize one another. That's if you believe the Bible. That's if you believe the Bible. And if you believe the Bible and interpret it correctly. So he's alive. Yeah, he died today. He died today, and meaning to us, but he's alive. He's alive. He's cancer-free. He's pain-free. Now, 74 years old, that's not too old, and it's not too young. What was more heartbreaking and tragic was when you had Nabil Qureshi die at 34. Nabil Qureshi was 34 years old, left behind a young, beautiful widow and a two-year-old daughter. But he too, he too, when he died, his spirit left his body. His soul left his body. And he entered the heavenly presence of Jesus Christ. That's if you believe the Bible. Now, if you're an atheist agnostic, this is all gob gobbledygook. But Christ is risen. He is alive. And he's sworn that we believe in him will never die. So <clears throat> Nabil II entered without his physical body, pain-free, cancer-free, disease-free. And he too has a spiritual shape and form by which the inhabitants of heaven recognize him. And now he sees Ravi and Ravi sees him. That's if you believe the Bible. Christ way, if I tell you, you're going to think I'm lying. Right? If I tell you, are you going to believe me or you think I'm lying? I may the Lord Jesus destroy every fear, every doubt, and give me the grace not to be a crowd pleaser. No, I do not fear death. I don't. I do not fear death. I fear my Lord Jesus. Only fear I have is that I don't finish the race by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus, and I die <clears throat> severed from Christ. That's my fear. Right? Right? That's my fear. But now, folks, not only do I want you to see the multi-part series on communion of saints that Andrew mentioned, I don't know if, you, if you're aware of this. Years ago on Pal Talk, I was asked, by Millie Fiore, Millie Fiore, <clears throat> to do a topic on death and dying for a sister in the Lord Jesus Christ named Josie. No, it's okay. You don't need to block. Uh, oh, I thought you said block Timberto. Okay, hold on, hold on. I, I, I am Pigeon who pooped on Hatun's head. Let me just uh, talk to him. But, oh, well, you timed him out. I'm going to talk... Guys, remember what I said, guys? Guys, listen, listen, folks. Remember the new policy now? <laughs> oh, my, my mods. Okay, guys, new policy. I'm trying by the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm trying to constrain myself, not stumble and sin in my anger when people attack. I'm trying to be patient. I'm trying to learn to be patient with blasphemers. The only time you block, here are the two conditions. If they blaspheme God, blaspheme Jesus' word, immediately block. If they justify abortion, which is murder, block. But that's why I'm going to talk to him. Give me a chance. Let me talk to this man. Just give me one moment. I am Pigeon who poops on Hatun's head. And he's talking about that video clip where a Pigeon came on top of her head. Friend, I am Pigeon. Are you here? I am Pigeon. Are you here? I'm trying to... Take the advice of several brothers and sisters in Christ, godly counsel, because from the mouth of two or three witnesses, then you take it that the Lord is speaking to you. And I'm trying to submit. Okay. Oh, he's out for five minutes. Okay. Coming back to the issue of Ravi. Ravi is a reminder to every one of us. Listen to me. Are you guys listening? My brothers and sisters. And by the way, you mods have permission to use your discretion. If you feel someone is block worthy for some other reason, Okay, go ahead, right? Because you may see that he's too much of a distraction, nuisance. That's okay. But if they insult me, that's okay. As long as they don't blaspheme the, the Lord God and, and mock his word or justify abortion, 
Let him mock me. It's okay. I'm, I'm trying to be a new man, and I won't be able to be success, successful unless the Holy Spirit gives me the power to do it. Ravi is a reminder, folks. Let me remind you. Can you listen intently for the glory of Jesus? Ravi, 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 Lord Jesus, loosen my tongue. Holy Spirit, save me from error. Ravi is a reminder. The Lord doesn't need us. The Lord doesn't need me. He doesn't need Ravi. He doesn't need David Wood. Jesus is God Almighty. He's alive. He will build his church, and he will not fail to build the church and preserve his church. No, you don't need him, Michelle. You don't need Ravi. You need Jesus. If you meant we need Jesus, yes, amen. Because when he said we need him, I'm sorry. I, I misunderstood you. Jesus is going to raise 10 million Ravi Zacharias's and better than him. Jesus is going to raise 20 million Sam Shamoons and better than me. Because you know why? I am nothing. This is the truth. I'm not trying to be humble here. I am not trying to be humble here. I'm letting you know and reminding you. I'm reminding you. Christianity is not about Ravi, James White, John MacArthur, John Piper, the Pope, it's about Jesus. Christianity is about Jesus. He is the God of all creation. He's the God of all Christians. We will come and go, but Jesus remains. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's about him. So it is an honor that the Lord Jesus would use me. It's an honor that he used Ravi in spite of our sins and imperfections. It is an honor to be called by Christ to serve him and love him and to be used by the Spirit to cause others to fall in love with Jesus. But at the end of the day, the Lord has been building his church for 2,000 years. And at the end of the day, Ravi Zacharias and I, let me be honest, and I'm not putting myself in the level of Ravi Zacharias. Please don't misunderstand me. We are no Apostle Paul, and we are no Athanasius. And we are no Ignatius, and we're no Irenaeus, and we are no, <clears throat> well, some people won't agree with me, Tertullian. You really want to be impressed? Don't be impressed by us today. Be impressed with your spiritual forefathers that went before you, who without technology, without printing press, shook the world, transformed the world, turned the world upside down, by their love, by their worship, by their purity, by their holiness, by their devotion, by their preaching, and by their willingness not only defend the faith by their words and by their pen, but by their deaths. Paul did not have printing press. Peter did not have a printing press. Athanasius did not have the internet. And yet, Without that technology, because Jesus was with them, they turned the world upside down. And we cannot hold a candlestick to them. And they could not hold a candlestick to Paul. And Paul isn't worthy to lick the sandals of Jesus. And that's the truth. You with me there? That's the truth. Do we got that now? See, as great as Ravi was, okay, now I am the pigeon, my friend. Let me let me ask you a very question. Okay. I am the pigeon who pooped on Hatun's head. Do you want to stay here in the channel and you want to listen and learn? Because the mods will block you, not for insulting me, for being distracting. You're going to start distracting. You're going to start bombarding us with your text, and they're not going to put up with it. Do you want to sit here and just listen? And even disagree with us, but still at least listen. Because I don't want to block you, friend. I don't. I'm trying to be patient. But I'm letting you know the mods will block you. They will block you. Okay. Because you're going to distract them. So be careful. It's up to you. Now, someone asked me about forced vaccinations. Okay, let me answer that so we can begin the topic. Are we ready? I want to answer that. Yep. Forced vaccinations. Someone is asking me about forced vaccinations in the context of the mark of the beast. 
Brother, if you're there, who are you talking to anyway, friend? You and your idiotic channel has been flagged. I have no idea who you're talking to. I can't pronounce his Greek name. Okay. All right. Someone was asking me about forced vaccinations. Yeah, look, I'm sorry. You're right. It's not Greek. I couldn't tell it. My eyes are not at what they used to be. Okay, Michael, you asked me about forced vaccinations in respect to the mark of the beast. Okay, let me explain what the mark of the beast is according to Revelation 13. The mark of the beast will be imposed on people as a sign of their allegiance to the Antichrist, taking him as their God and worthy of their worship in opposition to Christ. So forced vaccination, unless it's done for you to submit to the one world ruler, the Antichrist, and worship him as your God in opposition to Christ, has nothing to do with the mark of the beast. Are you with me there? Let me repeat, Michael. Revelation 13 is quite clear. The sin of the mark of the beast is not having a mark on your hand. It's taking the mark as your sign of allegiance to the beast and worshiping him as your God in opposition to Jesus Christ. That's the sin. Okay. Did you understand that, Michael? I'm going to say it one more time, Corbin. The sin of the mark of the beast has nothing to do with getting a tattoo or putting a chip. It has to do with taking the mark as your way of saying, I worship you, you are my God, and I deny Christ. It's done in the context of swearing allegiance to the beast in direct opposition to Jesus Christ. So if they come and tell you, we're going to force this mark on you because that's the leader, your Savior, your God, not Jesus, that's when you say, hell no. Are you with me there? Don't ask me about the significance of 666. The beast is a human leader empowered by Satan, filled by Satan, to cause people to worship him as God in opposition to Christ. That's Revelation 13, folks. Revelation 13. Okay. Now, if you're rejecting the vaccination because you think it's a mark of the beast, then you're wrong. It's not. But if you're rejecting vaccination for other reasons, maybe because someone was telling me it's made out of aborted fetuses, right? And that's why you reject it? Amen. Amen. If you reject the vaccination on other grounds, that's fine. I'm not telling you take it. But if you're rejecting it because you think that's the mark of the beast, and if you take it, you're swearing allegiance to the beast and God will condemn you, you're misreading Revelation 13. Exactly, Smokey. Folks, don't embarrass yourselves by saying, we're not taking the vaccine. It's the mark of the beast because then the people will laugh at you and then you're going to be responsible for then indirectly causing them to then take the real mark when the beast comes because they look at you as a joke. You understand my point? Yeah, don't worry about the 616. The, the proof, the evidence is a 666. I know Daniel Wallace and others. Don't worry about 616. Okay, let me repeat this again. I'm not going to listen. Don't ask me about Revelation, guys. I'm answering the question. Don't turn this about Revelation. Listen attentively. When you keep embarrassing yourselves, I, I believe, Dylan, partial preterism that doesn't deny the physical bodily return of Jesus from heaven to judge living and dead, that's acceptable. But full preterism that says Jesus will never return physically and the world will continue as it is, I can't accept that. I don't see it. It's unbiblical, and it's not found in church history. But follow me. Listen to what I'm saying. Listen. Listen carefully, because I'm not. it's not a discussion about revelation. But I want you to understand, if you start doing stuff where you say, no, we're not taking vaccination because it has a serial number, 60600, ah, then the world laughs at you and think you're stupid and your Bible is a joke. So that indirectly you'll be the cause 
of them taking the mark when the real beast shows up because they're going to laugh at you and your Bible saying, see, they're at it again. Here they think this is the Antichrist and that's the... Do not give unbelievers a weapon to mock the faith and discount the prophecies of the Bible because if you are not a Christian and you look at church history and see how Christians ascribe so many things to the beast and his mark, like you remember it was the credit card, wasn't it? When the credit card came out, oh, that's the, the mark. And you make the world laugh at you and think you're a bunch of imbeciles and your Bible is a joke so that indirectly you'll be the cause of them not taking the message of Revelation seriously so that when the beast shows up and you say, that's the beast, they're going to laugh at you. You know the boy who cried wolf? The boy who cried wolf? That's what they're going to look at you. Ha, 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 there they go again. Ha, <laughs> ha, Okay. Can you stop that? Can you stop that? You will know the mark of the beast because the mark of the beast will be imposed by the beast who's a world leader. He will come and demand that you worship him as God in opposition to Christ. And he will have someone doing miracles, bona fide miracles to convince you he is God and you need to worship him in opposition to Christ. And then when he tells you take his mark as a sign of you worshiping him, and swearing allegiance to him, that's when you say no. But until that happens, shut up and stop embarrassing the gospel. Yes, nightmare, your worst nightmare. Read Revelation 13. It tells you that the mark is imposed on you as a way of, of you swearing allegiance to the beast when he shows up with the false prophet and does miracles saying, see, I am the God that you need to worship. Forget your Jesus. That's when it's the mark of the beast. Until he shows up. He's not here. Stop embarrassing us. In fact, Andrew Martin, remember, do you remember it was the barcodes? Hey, they're now using the barcode. That's the mark. Be careful. You take the mark. Come on, man. You're embarrassing us. You are slandering the Bible, and people will take the Bible as a joke. In fact, here, let me prove it to you. Wait, wait, wait. Let me prove it to you. Let me prove it to you. Uh -huh. Satan has his children. Let me prove it to you. Here. Part of the reason why this book was written. Bart Ehrman is making the rounds again. Reason and Theology, a Catholic apologetics ministry, invited him to talk about this book. And an evangelical Christian named Chris Date interviewed him for this book. Okay? Here you go. Heaven and Hell... A History of the Afterlife by Bart Ehrman. Do you know why he wrote this? Because he says he got sick of people misinterpreting the book of Revelation, misapplying Revelation. And so he decided to write a book to tell you what Revelation really means in order to stop the Christian misinterpretation of Revelation. So because of that, more people are going to take what he says seriously who already hate the faith and laugh at you and your view of Revelation, especially when you keep making yourself look like a bunch of brain asses. Yes, an atheist agnostic. But he's so influential, Jake, 1999, that Christians have to take him seriously and interact with him. Do you know that? I'm not lying to you. I'm not lying to you. That's why I wrote the book right here. I got it. And the guy is a brilliant writer and speaker. He is captivating. If you're not grounded in your faith and you're, you're not cleaving to the Lord Jesus, he's captivating. He's a good debater. Go see what he did to Chris Date and to the Reason and Theology team. Go see. He was schooling them because he's on a mission to try to destroy people's faith in Christianity. I'm not exaggerating, okay? So you get my point? Let's stop embarrassing one another, folks. Let's stop embarrassing one another. Let me repeat. If you read Revelation 13 properly, no, he's not. Ariel, remember? He was on Reason Theology. He was pretty much schooling them, as he did Chris Date in Evangelical Ariel. I was just listening to an interview. Chris Date in, uh, invited him to Rethinking Hell. He's got an interview with him. I didn't finish it. Boy, was he schooling Chris Date. 
He's a serious opponent that we cannot take lightly. Okay, now with that said, oh yeah, I was watching her. Chris Day brought him because, brought him because he, he believes in annihilationism and he wanted to have Bart Ehrman explain why he believes the Bible teaches annihilationism. Okay, so let me repeat this one more time, one final time. One final time. That's okay, Garth Freeman. If you believe in annihilationism, I'm not here to change your mind. Let's focus on the topic. <clears throat> okay. Read Revelation 13 carefully, folks. Please. When is it the mark of the beast? And when is it sin to take it? When the beast, the human ruler, empowered by Satan, filled with Satan, used by Satan, accompanied by a false prophet, who will be empowered by Satan, Satan to do miracles, bona fide miracles, demanding the nations to worship him as God in opposition to Christ. That's when it's the mark of the beast. That's when you don't take it. Read Revelation 13, please. Up until that point, please do not mention, ah, oh, forced vaccination, Bill Gates, it's, it's, the, it's the mark of the beast, it's Gates. He thinks even his name, Gates, even his name, Gates, that's the gates to hell. Help me, save me. Yeah, well, because, yeah, you can read it, Zena. I'm not, I'm uh, partial preterist, yes. They try to say that this is referring to events leading to 70 AD. I'm not convinced, but that's okay. As long as they believe that Jesus will return physically, bodily. That's all that matter, matters. Okay. But that's what you're, so don't, no, it's not going to happen, Shalom Lechi. Don't turn it into a discussion eschatology. Lord willing, in the future, I'll talk about my views, which really doesn't mean anything, my views. Folks, let me just be honest and hurt your feelings. If you study the scriptures in context consistently, without any preconceived tradition, let me just break some of your hearts. There is no rapture before the seven years. And there is no rapture before the midpoint. At the midpoint, there isn't. I'm sorry to break your heart. Okay? God willing, in the future, I'll show you why this argument of a seven-year pre-tribulation rapture is a tradition that's recent in history. And you got to do a lot of quoting out of context of the Bible to, to arrive at that doctrine. Okay, guys? I know I'm going to upset some of you. You're going to get upset with me, but you asked my opinion, right? I used to believe the pre-trib pre rapture in seven years. But then again, what has been my prayer? What has been my prayer? Okay. What has been my prayer? Holy Spirit, please. Holy Spirit, please. You are God Almighty, the perfect teacher. Jesus sent you to seal us and preserve us in holiness and purity and love and devotion and to transform our thoughts, to think God's thoughts after him. Teach me. How to understand the Bible and save me from error. And it this journey with the Holy Spirit hasn't finished. Only he knows, the Holy Spirit knows, where I'll be a year from now if I live for another year. Or where I'll be 10 years from now. But I am trusting the Holy Spirit. And through that process, I believe the Holy Spirit has shown me, you're wrong here. Don't hold on to this. You're wrong here. Don't hold on to this. That position was right, though you opposed it. And that's my journey. Susan Mallow, what is this I call the police? What is up with you and the police? I call police. I don't get it. Who you call it? Why you want to call the police? Okay. Now, before I begin, I just want to make some book recommendations. Or not book recommendations. I just tell you, God has blessed me with a huge library. But most of my books are in storage. I don't have access to. And most of these books I have not read. Thank the Lord Jesus for calling me into the full-time ministry. And thank the Lord Jesus for blessing people and stirring their hearts to partner with me. Because that has helped me over the years to amass a library. I have a lot of books I haven't read. So when there is a book that's interesting, I purchase it and I shelve it until I need to then read it. Or at least look into that book for a particular point or argument. Right now... Here are the books that I have access to that I'm trusting the Lord will help me find time because we have nothing but time to devote myself to studying. Okay. Let me shock some of you because someone just spread a rumor about me and I'll mention it. I just showed you Bart Ehrman's book, right? 
Thank you, Christopher Acosta. Here it is. Heaven and hell, Bart Ehrman. Hopefully, God, by the grace of God, the f number one priority in the Christian life, your Bible. Re read your Bible or hear your Bible because that's God's word. That's number one. That's your spiritual food. Now, here's this. I want to read this book. I want to finish it, God willing. Now, here's some other books I want to read. Where is that? Now? Anyway, oh, yeah. Hold on one second. Yep, he's in a, well, uh, St. Dennis, here's what's ironic. He doesn't believe in heaven and hell. He doesn't believe in an afterlife. He doesn't believe in God. But he wrote a book showing that if you interpret the Bible correctly, the Bible teaches annihilationism, even though he doesn't accept the Bible. I can't, Razzles. It's a small apartment, and I can't fill my house with books because then I need to rent another apartment. And then that means, Razzles, instead of the 50 cents you send me every month, Razzle, you'd have to send me 500. Hey, 50 cents, you can't even buy a cup of coffee, Razzles. Come on now. Let me show you something. I needed to show you these books. And what I want to do for the benefit of those who haven't been raised in a Protestant tradition. Okay. Here was what I need to start reading. Pray God will give me spiritual and physical discipline. The spiritual discipline to be... <clears throat> Purposeful and intentional and in seeking God's face, worshiping him. That's for all of us. Praying to him daily. Praising him through songs and meditating on the Bible. And asking the Holy Spirit to help us to live out the truth of God. To live it, not just to pay lip service. To teach, because that's what the Lord's called me to do. Full-time ministry, that's what I want to do. To write from my blog and to read these books. Let me show you some books I have. Okay. See, I try to now read all sides. Evangelical Exodus. This is a book of a group of evangelical seminarians who went to an evangelical seminary that became Roman Catholic. Okay? So I want to read why. Okay? The case for Catholicism. The case for Catholicism. By who? Trent Horn. That's another book I want to read. Now, from the Protestant perspective. Okay? Two-volume work on justification. Justification, volume one and volume two by Michael Horton. I need to read this by the grace of God. Now, my goal is to read these books in time and not just read them, but read them to understand them because I want to hear all sides. Proverbs 18, 17. Proverbs 18, verse 17. The first to present his case seems right until... His neighbor comes and questions him. Let me repeat it again. Oh, yeah, Jason. Unfortunately, Jason, I lost one of the best books I've ever read from an Orthodox. I went to the Orthodox church in my neighborhood called St. Haralambos. Guys, forgive me. I, I don't know how to pronounce the name. St. Haralambos. It was an explanation of the Orthodox faith. Beautiful. I was reading it, and I was eating it up. I love the book. But guess what? I had put it on top of my car, and I drove, forgetting it was on top of my car, and that book is gone. I'm hoping to go back to the Orthodox Church and pick up that book. That book was wonderful. No, I wish I remember the name. I was so angry I lost that book. Thank you, Protestant. I just said I forgot the name of the book. But I know what it looks like, and I'm going to go back to the Orthodox Church. Hopefully they have a copy. I was so angry because it was wonderfully written. Wonderfully written. I was loving it. I was reading. I'm like, wow. And I lost it. I lost the book. I lost the darn book, man. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I'll find it. Now, here's what I want to do. Here's what I want to do. Okay. My upbringing has been Protestant. I've been raised in a Protestant upbringing, specifically Baptist, which is ironic because my parents are from the Assyrian Church of the East. But I wasn't catechized in the Assyrian Church. Thank you, Christopher. I wasn't catechized in the Assyrian Church. I was raised among Baptists and eventually evangelicals. So what I want to do, here's what I want to do, because I have a lot of Orthodox and Catholic. Just like a lot of Protestants don't understand what Catholics believe or Orthodox believe about, let's say, justification. You do have a lot of Orthodox and Catholic who do not 
understand what Protestants believe about justification. And then you have those Orthodox scholars and Catholic scholars that do understand what Protestants believe about justification and Protestant scholars who understand what Catholics believe and Orthodox believe about justification. Since we have a lot of Orthodox and Catholic, this is what I want to do. I want to do a series of talks on justification as understood by specific Protestants, as I was taught it, so that the Orthodox and Catholic can now understand why Protestants see justification this way, right? Now, unfortunately for me, unfortunately for me, I am not qualified to talk about the Catholic understanding of justification, nor am I qualified to talk about the Orthodox understanding of justification. But what I want to do, if you're interested, I want to do the series on what I was taught about justification from a Protestant perspective and then give you links to Roman Catholics and Orthodox and their view of justification so you can hear all sides and seek the face of the Holy Spirit to guide you into all truth. If you guys are interested, without this causing World War III and you stoning me and saying, see, he's not Protestant, he's not Orthodox, he's not Catholic, he's just confused. If you're interested. Okay? Because I'm not trying to convert you to any position. I'm not. Listen, if you worship the triune God, you worship the triune God, you love the triune God, you believe Jesus is the God-man who died, who rose physically, bodily, who sits enthroned physically, bodily, will return physically, bodily, he was conceived to and born from the Blessed Virgin without any man touching her. And you believe the Bible is inspired, inerrant, infallible word of God? You're my brother and sister. I am not trying to convert you to my position. I am not. So please do me a favor. If you believe you have the right understanding of, let's say, justification, challenging me and attacking me, as some do in the comment section, you're not going to get me to listen. That's what I said, the Trinity candidates, obviously. Trinity is a non-negotiable for me. Because I've had people in the comment section, hey, Sam, you know, you're a heretic, and you and Protestants are heretics, and you need to come back to the true church, Catholic church. I used to be Dominus. I'm not anymore. You know why? Because you have Orthodox here. You have Assyrian Church of the East here, and you have Catholics. You know, as a Catholic, when you say you're the true church, you're forgetting there are Orthodox who are listening and watching and commenting. And also, Orthodox, when you say you're through church, you have... So what's going to happen is the Orthodox will come in. No, 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 no. You lost your way. The Pope usurped too much authority. And the Catholic, no, the Pope is the vicar of Christ, the successor of Peter, and your bishops need to be in subjection to him. And then starts World War III. And Masihu Akbar! And Masihu Akbar! So if you guys want, without this leading into World War III, and you end up attacking me, I will do a series on justification from a Protestant perspective so you can hear that perspective and see what verses they post. So at least if you don't accept it, at least you see what they're quoting. And then I'll give you links to other views if you're interested. Finally, and we begin, finally, today a brother in Christ texted me. A brother in Christ texted me. Let me read to you what he sent me. Okay? So I'm saying that, yeah. How many text messages I got? All right. Look at this message, folks. Didn't I tell you this series I'm doing on Communist Saints? I'm going to get people to criticize me. Watch here. Guys, here's a text message. I want to tell you who the brother is. Watch here. George said, you jumping the fence and became a Catholic. George said, you jumping the fence and became a Catholic. Now, I won't mention the brother's name, but he's talking about George Sayed. George Sayed, who is the founder of Ministry to Muslims. The founder of Ministry to Muslims, who I've worked with in the past. He now is going around saying, I've become Catholic. And you know what's ironic about that? People in the West, West associate communion of saints with Catholicism. But they forget to realize that you have also Christians in the East, the Assyrian Church of the East, labeled Nestorian Church, the Miophysites. I know the Coptics are Miophysites. The Orthodox, and they believe in the communion of saints. Why automatically assume I became Catholic? Maybe I went back to the Assyrian Church. Maybe I'm looking into an Orthodox Church. Or maybe I'm confused. I'm Roman Orthodox. 
of the East. So I combine all three. I'm Roman Orthodox of the East who protest against everyone. How do you know what I am and what I will be? I will be whatever the Holy Spirit wants me to be for the glory of Jesus. Whatever the Holy Spirit wants me to be for the glory of Jesus. I will be Roman Orthodox of the East who protest against everyone. How about that? The protesting Roman Orthodox of the East. You like that, folks? You want to label me? Label me. The protesting Roman Orthodox of the East. Okay. And you know why I'm wearing my, my Coke t-shirt? We're going to begin right now. You know why I'm wearing the, my Coke t-shirt? Because I want to be friendly, right? I like to buy the world a Coke. You know that commercial where if you love someone, you give them a Coke, right? So that's why I'm my shirt. Now, for you Jamaicans, the other day I was singing a song. Remember I was singing, come back to Jamaica. What's old is what's new. That's right. Now, Ariel, that's one of my Sahi narrations, Ariel. Ariel, you've been commissioned to write my Sahi collection. You have to have three narr narrators in the chain that you heard me say, I am the protesting Roman Orthodox of the East. Okay, now. So you know I wasn't making up that song. Here you go. Here you go. And we begin. Come back to Jamaica. Come back to gentility. What's old is what's new. Come back to your beauty. We want you to join us. Come back. Come to back, our back. people. We may be for you. Back to hospitality. So make it Jamaica. Come back. Come on, 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 Okay, that's it. You got it. I gave you the link. Okay, let's begin now. These are the three questions I want to answer because it came up yesterday and it was already over two hours, so I didn't have time to address them. Guys, do remind me to give you links to some of my art articles. La Aziza Razzles, Khali Ola Burazel. I'm going to speak a Syrian to you, Jilu style. Khali Burazel. That's a bad word, Golishane. Do you want me to speak Ola Majnaya to you? That's a bad word, Golishane. Khali Shwaribu. I know Hafsa. Bak, bak, bak. She likes that. We don't say that because that's a bad word in Jamaican. I learned that from a Jamaican brother. You don't say that. Khali the Razzles. Razzles, why don't you just start World War III? Start throwing swear words and give people my social security and where I live so they can come and behead me. All right. With that said, yesterday we went over two hours and glory to God, we had about 300 people. Glory to the triune God. I pray it increases. Now. There were three questions asked. I couldn't answer them because I ran out of time. All three questions have been answered previously, but I'm going to answer them because now we're going to have one session where people will find the verses. I keep getting asked the question about Mark 13, 32, which I've answered dozens of times. But recently, Matthew 16, 28 has come up. So let's begin. Pray for me that the Spirit will fill me and bless you for the glory of Christ. Okay, now, Matthew 16, 28. What's the question? What's the objection? Okay, Corbin, God bless you, buddy. See, here we go. Revelation 17. <laughs> is the Roman Catholic Church. Okay. Can I address this real quickly? Jesus is mighty God. If you were to expand your knowledge, Jesus is mighty God. Let me real quickly address this. Okay. You would know that there are even Roman Catholics that think that the Antichrist will arise from the papacy, not because the Roman Catholic Church is false, but because Satan will infiltrate the church, being the true church, and try to corrupt it and mislead people. So even if you say, see again, if you just open yourself to a variety of opinions, even if you say, even if you say revelations about the Roman Catholic Church, that still doesn't mean 
Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not Roman Catholic, but I'm just trying to say that still doesn't mean it's a false church. It only means it's a church that's infiltrated by Satan because he sees it's, and this is an argument by Catholics, by the way. Ask any Catholics, they'll tell you, because it's a true church, that's why Satan has <clears throat> penetrated it. Satan is attacking it. Satan is inf infiltrating it. Are you with me there? You have Catholics like Michael Voris, Michael Voris, who is a militant, diehard Roman Catholic who loves his church. He will tell you Satan has infiltrated the Vatican. Satan has infiltrated the Vatican. But they'll tell you the reason why. That's an argument that it is true. Because why would Satan infiltrate a church that's corrupt? You understand my point? Yeah. And Taylor Marshall. Okay, but Jesus is mighty God. You understand? You're not showing to Catholics that their church is false. What you're actually showing them is our church is true and it's been infiltrated by Satan. But the true believers of the church see it for what it is and are calling it out. They're calling it out, not only you. In fact, here, Jesus is mighty God. You got Catholics here. Is there any Catholic here that would not say that what the Pope did in kissing the crown was wrong? How many of you Catholics say he was wrong for kissing that book, that unholy book? I want the Catholics to speak. Okay. All right. Ah, not you Protestants or Orthodox. The Catholics. You want me there? Okay. How many of you Catholics also agree that Pope Francis is an embarrassment and doesn't represent the true historic position of the Roman Catholic Church? That he's an embarrassment. And he's a leftist Marxist. See? So can we stop, please? And guys, you're putting me in a position to defend these churches, and I'm not a member of these churches. And then you're going to have George, my friend George. You see what you just did? George is going to say, you see, you see, Brother Sam, Brother Sam, he's defending Catholic Church. I told you, Brother, Brother, he's now Roman Catholic, Brother Sam. All right, let's begin. Matthew 16, 28. Okay. Folks, Netta said something yesterday. Do I think I'm the unifier of the churches? No, I'm not. I'm not a unifier. I'm a sinner that's trying to be honest to God and scriptures and be loving to those who I believe are brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, Eli, I don't know if you understand it, that the Catholics believe that the office of the Pope is in, ordained by Christ, but not everyone who assumes that office is truly a Christian. He can be of the devil, an anti-Pope. So you're not catching the Catholics by surprise. They already say the office of the Pope is an office instituted by Christ, but not everyone who has assumed that office was a true Christian. He could have been a plant of the devil, use of the devil. And this is not a modern argument. You can find way back that one of the Popes, Honorius, was condemned by subsequent Popes for teaching the heresy, what they believe the, her the heresy of monothelitism. Now, Catholics, am I wrong here? Yeah. Am I wrong in what I'm saying here? Can you help me out here? Because you guys should be doing this, not me. Okay. So, folks, can you leave me be? I don't want <laughs> I'm not an apologist for the churches, man. I want to be a servant of Jesus and serve the churches. So can you? Because, again, see, it's like, you know, you know uh, what was it, Al Pacino? In The Godfather, they keep pulling me in. Every time I want to get out, they keep pulling me in. I'm going to get more. I'm going to get more text messages. Brother, Tham Shabon, brother, he's now become Catholic. He crossed the Tiber. Brother, warn people, warn people. Okay. Yeah. Here's someone that really is high on themselves. Amazing Sam Shimon. Someone did a video refuting the Trinity. My Trinity. Oh, yeah. They refuted me, all right, which is why the cowards will never debate me because they'll see what I'll do to them and their false god. You know what I am, brother? That is one of the mysteries, Thon Theon. And it's not Thon Theon, by the way. It's Thon Theon. 
one of the mysteries is who am I and when am I? When am I? Santian, do you know I'm more brilliant than Einstein? Let me tell you why I'm more brilliant than Einstein. Few people were able to figure out Einstein. Till this day, nobody is able to figure me out. That's the level of brilliance. I'm such a genius and a paradox. People look at me and say, what are you? Who are you? Making me more brilliant than Einstein. Because there are some people that figure him out. Till this day, no man has figured me out. <laughs> Let's not make it about me. Let's go to Matthew 16, 28. Okay, let's go to Matthew 16, 28. Okay. Okay, let's read, folks, the objection. Verily I send to you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean that Jesus said some of those standing before him would not die until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom? Obviously, they all died, and if Jesus coming in his kingdom means Jesus returning to the earth, that never happened. Is this a false prophecy? You understand the objection? Can we now get to the objection? It's because I want to answer this. I already answered this in one of my previous sessions, but are you ready for the answer now? Have I gotten your attention? Uh, friend, we just said, if anyone mocks the Trinity, blasphemes the Trinity, we're going to muzzle them and send them to their doghouse. Stop making fun of the Trinity because you're going to embarrass yourself. No, 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 Jake. Instead of you telling me what you think, you understand what the objection is, though? Okay, Rob Dylan. Uh, you know, the same people point to the schisms of the church to show there was no church until Joe's witnesses restored the truth, Rob Dylan. So if you're going to go that far, take it to the extreme and say the church was lost. Because in the West, the only church you had representing Christianity was the Roman Catholic Church. And in the East, none of those churches agree with you or are identical to what you believe. So don't go there. You're going to end up destroying your own faith and become a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon or an agnostic. But now understand what the objection is. Okay, Jesus said those standing in front of him, some of them will not die until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. If coming in his kingdom means the second coming, they all died. It's a false prophecy. So is this a false prophecy? What's the answer? Are, you re are we ready for the answer? Are you ready for the answer? Are we ready now for the answer? Not going to side talks and tangents, please. All right. Mike for Christ, you're not ready for the answer? Okay. So Mike for Christ is not ready for the answer. Okay. Everyone else is? All right. Everyone else is ready for the answer. Okay. Number one. If you follow me, you're going to get the answer. Number one, this saying of Jesus is found not only in Matthew, but Mark and Luke. Yeah, one means yes, two means no. Okay. This saying of Jesus is found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So Matthew records the saying of Jesus. Mark records the saying of Jesus, and Luke does. So now let's look at the two other versions. Let's go to Mark 9.1. Mark 9.1. Follow, it, follow with me so I can explain it's not a contradiction and we can move on. Is Anna here, my precious sister? I thought she was. Okay. Mark 9, verse 1. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there be some of them that stand here, which shall not taste of death, till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Now notice, kingdom of God come with power. Kingdom of God come with power. Thank you, Rob Diamond. Rob, can we focus on these objections, brother? If you want to have a discussion about the Pope and the Catholics, there are Catholic channels that do that, brother. Honestly, there are. Reason and theology. And if you want to hear an Orthodox pers perspective, Jay Dyer. But focus on this passage, Mark 9, 1. And he said unto them, Verily I send to you, that there be some of them that standeth here, stands here, which shall not taste of death till they have seen the King God come with power. Kingdom of God come with power. Kingdom of God come with power. Okay, so now Mark records the saying of Jesus. Same saying. What about Luke? Luke 9, 27. Jesus is mighty God. Be patient. I'll show you what the answer is. It's so easy. You're going to say, wow. Just let me first give the verses. Luke 9, 27. But I tell you of a truth. There be some standing here 
which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God. So notice Matthew, Mark, and Luke. All three of them record the saying of the Lord Jesus Christ. No, orthodox defense, that's the answer. You got it. That's the answer. Contextually, that is the answer. And I gave that answer a while back. You were right. That's the answer. Now, you want to know what the answer is? Orthodox gave it to you. Folks, is it a coincidence? Is it a coincidence that all three Gospels, after narrating Jesus' words, followed up with Jesus going to the mount and transfiguring before them? All three, when Jesus says it, all three Gospels follow up with the transfiguration. Let me show you. Matthew 17, verse 1. Because it came up again, I'm going to answer it, and that's it. I, hopefully, I want to answer this again. Hopefully. Okay? Matthew 17, verse 1. And after six days, notice, right after he says it, after six days, Jesus taketh notice some of them. Some of them, right? Only three, not all twelve. Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth, bringeth them up into a high mountain apart. Mark 9, 2. What's good? Are you going to waste my time with nonsense that we've already refuted? Stick around. If you want an answer, I'll answer that if you're not here to play games. Okay. Now, Mark 9, verse 2. Mark 9, verse 2. And after six days, Jesus taketh with him Peter and James and John, notice three, only some of them, leadeth them up into a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. What about Luke? Does he follow up with the transfiguration? Luke 9, 27. Uh, Luke 9, 28. I'm sorry, Luke 9, 28. Thank you, Orthodox Defense. Man, coming from you, that's a blessing, bro. You really mean that? Can you now pray for me to be holy, sold out for Jesus, and holy and pure and just... Self-discipline to pray and fast and worship. Thank you, bro. Luke 9, 28. And it came to pass about an eight days after these sayings, he took Peter and John and James and went up into a mountain to pray. Now, folks, amen. May the Lord Jesus shine his face on you, Orthodox, and everyone here. May the trying God flood every one of you, and I mean that, myself and our families, and the infinite love of our God. Wash us in the blood of the Lamb and seal us by the Spirit. We beg you, Father, Son, and Spirit, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. We're going to be together forever, folks. Folks, I pray we're all born of the Spirit because we're going to be together forever. We will be together in glory. No more death, no more pain, no more differences. We're going to be worshiping Jesus and loving each other perfectly. Saudi Prince, I'll get to that in a minute. Okay, now, do you see that all three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Amen. Muhammad ibn Jaris, Jai and everyone else, save his comment. Folks, Muhammad ibn Jaris has left Islam. He now worships the triune God. Notice what he just said. Praise our triune God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Welcome to the family of God, Muhammad ibn Jaris. May the Spirit seal you and the blood of the Lamb secure you, and you'll be with us forever in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. I'm excited, man. <laughs> oh, I feel like dancing. It's foolishness, I know. Yeah, all right. Now, is it a coincidence? Is it a coincidence that all three Gospels follow up what Jesus said with Jesus taking some, not all, some disciples, Peter, James, and John, to a high mountain? Okay. Is it a coincidence? Or are they want are they trying to make you see the connection? Hallelujah. They are, they are rejoicing, Mary. Okay? Do they want you to see the connection? I remind. That when Jesus says some of them will see the kingdom before they die, the kingdom they saw manifested on the mount when he was transfigured before some of them a week later. Hold on, Mike. Let me finish these questions, brother. If you ask me a question and I go off topic, then no one benefits. Yep. Okay. Now, did everyone get that? The kingdom of God appearing in power is how Jesus will appear when he comes in glory. 
And on the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus showed them what he appears as when he's in his glory. They got a taste of what Jesus looks like in his heavenly glory and what he will look like when he comes in power. And some of them saw it, not all of them. Exactly orthodox defense. So now let's read Matthew 17, verses 1 to 9. That's the answer. Just keep reading context. All three Gospels follow up what Jesus said with the Mount of Transfiguration. They already tell you what it means. Yep, only some saw it, not all. Amen. He's infinitely beautiful. Okay, now Matthew 17, verses 1 to 9. Here's the answer, folks. Watch here. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. See, he manifested what he looks like, his glorious appearance, the appearance he has when he's in glory right now in heaven and when he returns. That's how he appears. Not as a humble carpenter, but as the radiant, glorious, <clears throat> luminescent, almighty son of God, whose glory will be seen visibly by all eyes when he appears. So he allowed them to see that. Only some saw it, right? Face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with them. Now I'll tell you why Moses and Elias was talking with them. I'll get to that. You, if you're patient with me, I'll get to that. I promise you. <clears throat> then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, because he's frightened. He doesn't know what's going on. He is panicking. He's like freaking out. What am I seeing, man? It is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make three here, three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, one for Elias. Notice, folks, they realized that was Moses and Elias. Pay attention. Guys, please remember. I want to unpack the meat of scripture for you guys. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Now watch 6 to 9. Watch 6 to 9. Oh, they did? Okay. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid, trembling. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. Now watch verse 9. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen from the dead. Do you guys catch it? Some of them saw the Son of Man appearing in his glory. The glory he possesses, the glory he will manifest when he comes in his kingdom to the earth. He gave them a foretaste. He gave them a foretaste. Okay? Only some saw it. The rest didn't. Peter, James, and John. They saw it. The rest didn't. So this is how Jesus appears when he comes in his kingdom in the glory of his Father, manifesting his glory for all to see. I think I do Jesus is king. Did everyone get it or no? Because I'm now going to show you what Peter says about this experience. What Peter says about this experience. Exactly, Talitha. It shows that Muhammad was demon-possessed. Peter himself, David with fan account, Peter himself mentions this event and describes it as Jesus being revealed in glory. So... Only some saw it, Peter, James, and John, the rest didn't. They saw what Jesus looks like when he's in his glory. Right now in heaven, in heaven you don't see a humble carpenter, an ordinary flesh and blood Jew. You see the God-man in his <clears throat> indestructible physical body, illuminating with the glory of divinity, shining with the glory of divinity. That's how he appears in heaven. And that's how he'll appear when he comes in his power to the earth. So they were given a foretaste. Here's what I look like. 
they saw the Lord's glorious appearance, his heavenly appearance, what he appears as when he's in his heaven, on his throne, and how he'll appear when he returns. <clears throat> and let me show you what Peter says. 2 Peter 1, 16 to 18. Who said that you must necessarily die? Kula vinin. Who said that God cannot empower you by the Spirit to see his glory displayed without dying? He just did it for them. So what do you mean? Okay, now, 2 Peter 1, 16, 18. I don't see verse 16. Did you post it, brother? 2 Peter 1, 16, 18. Exactly orthodox defense. Even though you're speaking foreign language, they don't understand what orthodox mean between energies and essence. The essence of God is unfathomable, but his energies can be manifested. You're talking a foreign language because even someone like me, well, I'm not trying to say I'm something special. Forgive me. I'm saying even someone that has interacted with various traditions, I still need to study what the distinction is. But anyway, 2 Peter 1, 16, 18. Now read. For we have not followed, Peter speaking of the experience, for we have not, we, for we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty, for he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, and this voice which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. Did you catch it? We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And we saw the glory and the honor that he possesses by virtue of being the beloved son of the father. And the father's voice we heard audibly testifying to the glory of the son. Right? So now that I've answered Matthew 16, 28, is that clear? I don't need to... Answer this again. David Wood fan account. You will see Jesus in glory when you enter heaven or if he returns now. So even though you are not there to see it, this is what we call the beatific vision. All believers born of the spirit will see the glorious luminescent Christ. Okay. That is the privilege that Jesus gives us who are the members of his body. In fact, right now as we speak, you know who just beheld that glory of the sun? You know who just saw the luminescent glory of the divine son of God? Ravi Zacharias. If you believe. See, if you're an agnostic atheist, this is all, you know, make-believe, fiction. But if you believe this is the word of God, and the historical Jesus walked this earth. And the historical Jesus rose from the dead. And he's alive. Then you must believe Ravi, when his soul left, he saw the glory of the sun. Exactly, Mike A.D. That's what's astonishing. What's good? Can you be patient with John 14, 28? If you want an answer, be patient. I've already done a video on it. And I have articles on it. I'll address you. Just be patient. This is not about you. I know you think it's your world and we're squirrels in your world. Okay. Okay, everyone clear? Everyone clear? Yeah, you want to be with the Lord today. Yes, it means that you're going to see the glorious luminescent Son of God in His glorified physical body with the glory of his divine essence, the glory radiating. So you have no doubt, behold you, before you is the God-man. You'll see him for who he is, the God-man, not simply as a flesh and blood Jew who had covered his glory so that when he was on earth, the Jews couldn't recognize this was their God. Al-Majim, do you really want me to answer you and embarrass you with this, man? Do you really want me to attack Muhammad and show why Muhammad is scum for... Creating zombies like you, blasphemous pigs like you. Okay. Now, with that said, let's go back to Matthew 17. Let's read verses 2 and 3 again. Matthew 17, verses 2 to 3. 
Exactly. Judas was one of those who died. He never got to see the glorious Christ manifest because he wasn't on the mount. And he never got to see the risen Christ. Okay, now, Matthew 17, 2 to 3. Guys, pay attention here. Matthew 17, 2 to 3. And was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. Okay. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with them. Moses and Elias talking with them. Now, verse 4. Don't let the children of Satan distract you guys. Verse 4. Watch here, because I'm going to tie it all in. Watch here. Before the rapture. Oh, you did. I'm sorry. I was going to blame him for my mistake. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, one for Elias. Folks, pay attention. I want you to pay attention to learn. Moses and Elias would have appeared without their bodies. And I covered that in great depth yesterday. In other words, when they're appearing, they don't have physical bodies. And yet, Peter knew that was Moses, that's Elias. So what do you learn here? You learn two things. Even without a physical body, you have a spirit. Your spirit leaves your body, and your spirit has a shape and a form by which you can be recognized. It's number one. You with me there? You with me there? Everyone with me there? So that means when people ask me, will we recognize loved ones? Yes, you will. Because Peter has never seen Moses and Elias, Elijah. But when they showed up, it was made known to him. These are two persons standing in front of you, but they don't have bodies, meaning physical ones. Yeah, they don't. But their spirits have a shape and form to distinguish them from each other. So you know it's not the same spirit. It's two different spirits because they have a shape and form that <clears throat> distinguish, distinguishes one from the other. And it's made known to them that's Moses and Elias. So you will recognize loved ones who have died in Christ. You have it right here. You want me here? You will recognize loved ones. The Bible doesn't teach soul sleep. That is an unbiblical doctrine. It teaches the souls and spirits of the dead continue to exist consciously apart from the body. And you know what's beautiful? Even medical science is confirming it. The field of medical science, the medical field, confirms it with out-of-body experience, near-death experience, where they've done studies, and even doctors who are not Christians have come to the conclusion consciousness exists apart from the brain, and that consciousness exists when a person is dead. So science is catching up with biblical truth. Okay? Clear? Is that clear? All right. Now, why did Moses and Elias appear? Why did Moses and Elias appear? Because Moses represents the law and Elijah the prophets. You know what this was showing Peter, James, and John? All of the Old Testament is about Jesus. Moses and Elijah were showing, showing everything we did was about him. Everything we did was for him. All that we did, all that we prophesied, had him as the focus of our ministry and our prophesying because it's all about him and we all bear witness to him. So Moses and Elijah appearing to Peter, James, and John was a sign to them. The Old Testament is all about him. I, Elijah, represent the prophets. I, Moses, represent the law, and we're here to bear witness to this one. This one, it's all about him. All we did was for him. All we wrote was for him. We were preparing Israel for him, his coming, because we exist for him. You with me there? 
Is it is it sinking in before I move on? Or am I boring you? Because we went from 200 down to 164. I don't know. It's like, man, I, I lose people. Are you with me there? So this is a message to the unbelieving Jews. Unbelieving Jews. This happened, whether you like it or not. Jesus was on the mount. He transfigured. And your own law and prophets bear witness of him. There is no other Messiah besides this one. And if you reject him, you have no Messiah. Now let me show you something else. Something that's even beautiful. Just as beautiful. Acts 9. Acts 9. Let's pick it up from 27 to 35. Acts 9, 27 to 35. Watch this. I'm sorry, Luke 9. Why don't I think Acts 9? I'm sorry, Protestant. I'm, you're contagious. You're more deadlier than COVID. Thank you, Choose Jesus. God bless you, brother. You know, because your Alzheimer's is kicking in and it's affecting me. Luke 9, 27 to 35. Exactly, Talitha. And actually, the only reason why I want more people, Talitha, so they can learn this stuff, absorb it, fall in love with Jesus more passionately, and then teach it to others. That's the only reason why. Luke 9, 27, 35. Watch here. But I tell you of a truth, there will be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God. Now pay attention. Guys, pay attention. You're going to love this one. You're going to love this version. Okay. You're going to love this version. Okay. And it came to pass about an eight days after these means approximately close to eight days. Not on the eighth day, but about the eight days later. After six days, which makes it the seventh day. And I'll get to that some other time. Eight days after these sayings, he took Peter and John and James and went up into a mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered. And his raiment was white and glistening. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Eli Elias. Now pay attention what they're talking to him about. Watch here. Watch here. Moses and Elias, who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. Wait, wait, wait. We're going to come back to 31. Pay attention to 31. But Peter and they that were with him were heavily with sleep. And when they were awake, they saw his glory and the two men that stood with him. Now watch 33. We're going to come back to 31. Just read with me. And it came to pass as they departed from him. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two men with him departed from him. Peter said unto Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias, not knowing what he said because he's afraid. While he thus spake, there came a cloud and overshadowed them, and they feared as they entered into the cloud. And there came a voice out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. Now, folks, Luke 9, 31. Luke 9, 31. One more time. Watch here. He who, who appeared in glory and spake of his deceits, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. Folks, do you want more proof that the Old Testament saints all knew that they were saved by the grace of Jesus and by his vicarious death? Because here you just read that Moses and Elias spoke to Jesus about his upcoming death in Jerusalem. How do they know? How did they know? How did Moses and Elijah know that Jesus was destined to go to Jerusalem to die? Because that would be his exodus into heaven. And if they knew that, are you telling me that Moses and Elijah did not know that they were saved because of Jesus and not because of any works of the law they did? You understand what I'm proving here? Yeah, I know the Holy Spirit revealed it to them. But you understand? Yeah, it's not. I'm not asking how they know. Obviously, God told them. The Father revealed it to them. The Son revealed it. But you understand the implication. Moses and Elijah are talking to Jesus about his exodus, that he's going to go to Jerusalem and be killed and enter glory, which means they knew that Jesus had come to die on the cross for the salvation of God's people before he entered glory. 
How do they know that? Well, we know because God revealed it to them. But wait, you understand the implication? If God had revealed it to them, the Messiah was coming to die before he enters his glory, and he's dying for the salvation of the world, specifically all who believe in him. That means Moses and Elijah knew that their salvation came from Christ, not from the works of the law. You with me there? Is it sinking in or no? Before I move on to the next point. Is it sinking in? Before I move on to the next point. Moses and Elijah knew he is our Savior. It is by his grace, his mercy, his righteous life, his death, resurrection, that we are saved, not the law. And they're bearing witness to it. Let, now, let me further prove that from what Jesus says in Luke. Not knowing who, what he said. Who, what are you talking about? Mike AD, what are you talking about? That's Peter, dude. What has Peter got to do with Moses and Elijah, Mike? Mike, why are you all over the place, dude? Peter didn't know what he was talking about, just like you don't know what you're talking about because you're confused. <laughs> don't be upset, Mike. Watch yourself. It means Peter did not know what he's talking about because he was frightened, he was shocked, and he was speaking gibberish. Okay, Mike? Suck MC, call me sire, Mike. Okay, Luke 24, 25 to 27. Luke 24, 25 to 27. Thank you, Jesus mighty God. But I advise you not to control my thoughts. So Jesus mighty God, notice what you did. You don't want me to control people's thoughts, but you want to control mine. Excellent, brother. You are so consistent, you shock me. Luke 24, 25 to 27. Read with me. Read with me. Then he said unto them, Jesus speaking to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Did you catch it? Moses and the prophets prophesied Messiah would suffer and die and rise on the third day. They knew Jesus was their Savior. They knew Messiah would come and die and rise from the dead, enter glory. And it's on that basis they were saved because they prophesied it. Okay, Luke 24, 44 to 47. So I'm going to make a couple more points, a couple more points, and we're going to go to the other objection. If you guys are not tired and we don't go down to 50 viewers. Luke 24, 44 to 47. Okay. And he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you, while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which are written in the law of Moses, that's Moses, and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. What was written about you, Lord? Then opened he their understanding. So the Holy Spirit has to open your mind to understand and believe what you read. That's the work of grace. That they might understand the scriptures. And said unto them, thus it is written, and thus it behoved, it was necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Did you see what Jesus just said? Moses, the prophets, the Psalms, all prophesied that the Christ, which is I, I, the Christ, must suffer, rise on the third day, and enter glory, which is the basis for forgiveness of sins for those who repent. They all wrote about this, which means they all knew about this. Well, if they knew, all knew about this, that means they knew their salvation came from Messiah, whom they eagerly desired to see, and not from the law. That's why Moses and Elijah show up, bearing witness. Bearing witness. No, they didn't need to know. Sidney Bello, it's like asking me, do all the Christians know with the Bible, what the Bible teaches? 
about the Trinity, about Jesus being the God man, and about the Old Testament prophecies. Sydney, do all Christians know that? Why would you expect the Jews to know that? Here we got Christians who have the full revelation preserved in the scriptures, and we still are biblically illiterate, most of us anyway. Right, Sydney? I like your name, by the way, Sydney Bellow. So what would you what makes you expect the Jews to figure this out? Thank you, Riaz. Thank you guys for your super chat. It's not that I'm not acknowledging you. God bless you. I'm just into the discussion. Now, some brownie points, guys. Some brownie points. Whether you like it or not, whether you like it or not, here you have a biblical basis for God sending people from the netherworld to speak to you in dreams and visions. God can send to you an angel or a prophet or an apostle or even a loved one to speak to you in a dream or vision because you just saw it on the Mount of Transfiguration. That's number one. So when people ask me, can God send my mother to speak to me in a dream and vision after she's dead? Or my father or my child? Yes. Don't let someone tell you otherwise. Yes. Because you find it in the Bible. Are you with me there? You're right? If God can send the spirits of two prophets that were dead for centuries to confirm, then God can do that today because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. No, I said dream or vision, Leviticus. Pay attention, brother, and don't debate me on this. I said dream or vision because in Matthew 17, 9, it says it was a vision. Doesn't mean it wasn't real. Thank you, Candence. Thank you, Candace. Let me repeat what you just said. After my dad's death, he came in a dream and yelled at me for dating a boy. Glory to God. Don't think it's your overactive imagination. But then a related point. You understand if God sends a spirit of someone who's departed to speak to you in a dream and vision, you know what that means? You guys understand the implication or no? Let's see who caught it. Ariel caught it earlier. Ariel caught it. Okay. He caught it. He mentioned it. You know what that means? If the Lord sends a prophet or an apostle or a saint or a loved one to speak to you, to your condition, that means they are aware of what's taking place in your life because God is revealing it to them. Bingo. Thank you, Candace. Bingo. You with me there? They, for them to speak to you and to your need means God has informed them. These are the verses that led me to accept communion of saints as a biblical truth. You see? The Catholics didn't force me to accept this. The Orthodox, these passages that were brought up troubled me and I wrestled with them until I finally submitted You want me there? And, as, as, and since we're on this subject, since we're on this subject, can God use the artifacts of believers filled with the Spirit that God used mightily on earth? Can He use their artifacts to <clears throat> bestow blessings and grace? 2 Kings 13 20 to 21. 2 Kings 13 20 to 21. Let me show you. You got it, Romans. I'm coming there. Yep, 2 Kings 13, 20 to 21. And Elisha died, and they buried him. And the bands of the Moabites invaded the land at the coming in of the year. Now watch, guys. And it came to pass, as they were burying a man, that, behold, they spied a band of men, and they cast the man into the sepulchre, of Elisha, and when the man was let down and his body touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood up on his feet. Wow! God used the bones of his holy prophet who was filled with the spirit and anointed, and his bones touched the dead body and brought it to life. 
What a mark. Beauties. <whistles> Acts 19, 11 to 12. You see why I changed my position? If it wasn't biblical, I wasn't going to change my position. Too much Bible verses showing I had to stop being stubborn. Acts 19, 11 to 12. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs, handkerchiefs from his body that he used, right, to wipe his sweat, whatever, or aprons that he wore. And the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. <whistles> what do you make? You make them beauties. So, is there a biblical basis? Is there a biblical basis for believing that God will use the artifacts of holy men and women filled with the Spirit, used mightily to glorify Christ on earth? Yes. Okay. Let me show you another one. Acts 5. Acts 5. Verses 14 to 16, specifically verse 15. Acts 5, verses 14 to 16, specifically verse 15. <coughs> and believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes, both of men and women. Now watch, Pedro, watch. Insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. Just a shadow. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed, every one. Folks, when's the last time? When's the last time you heard a sermon? And by the way, like I said, I'm Protestant, so don't think I'm attacking. When is the last time you've heard a sermon from a Baptist or an evangelical preacher mentioning these verses, the bones of Elisha? the handkerchiefs and aprons of Paul, the shadow of Peter being used by God to heal people and cast out demons. When's the last time you heard it? Okay. What's my point? Are you a biblicist? Are you a biblicist? No, 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 Phantom. Dude, my, my brother from a different mother, Phantom. You are confusing something biblical with an abuse that's an abomination. Phantom, don't you understand that people can take something that's biblical and run with it to the extreme, end up abusing it and turning it into an abomination? Sucking blessings out of the grave, that is, the, do I need to comment on that, brother? But one thing I don't want you to do, Phantom, don't let the abuses of something discourage you from believing that something is biblical. You can have something that's biblical and people taking a biblical truth and running with it and perverting it and turning it into something that's an abomination. And you had Catholics and Orthodox admitting that yesterday with communion of saints. Here, Catholics and Orthodox, is it not true that you have people who take communion saints to the extreme and end up idolizing and deifying the saints by saying things of them that even you would condemn as idolatrous. Mike A.D., brother, you don't go looking for skulls and fingers, bro. Take it easy, bro. Don't scare me here. Okay? All I'm doing is giving you what the Bible says. Okay? What did I just give you? The, what the Bible says. So you cannot convince me it is not biblical that God doesn't use the bones of his saints, the handkerchief, the apron, the shadow of his saints. It's in the Bible, and you can't convince me that God can't send spirits of those who are dead in Christ to communicate with you on earth because it's in the Bible. So I'm going to ask you again. Forget the abuses. Forget those who have taken these Biblical truths and perverted them and turned them into idolatry or abominations, disgracing the Lord. Forget that, man. Put them aside. It's like saying those who speak in gibberish and call it tongues 
means that the Holy Spirit never empowered the apostles to speak in tongues. Nonsense. It's in the Bible. I don't care what this guy does. If he's abusing it, shame on him. The Lord rebuke him. But that doesn't undermine its biblical basis. You want me there? Sidney Bellow. Who can tell you it doesn't happen? Where does the Bible say it stopped? That's my point. So if someone tells me, right, someone tells me, well, what example can I give? I, I can't give any example. Forget about it. All I'm saying is you cannot tell me it's not biblical if you don't have a biblical basis for saying that God has stopped working through that manner. You get my point? You can't tell me it stopped if the Bible doesn't say it stopped. So if someone tells me, for example, well, I, I can't. I, I, I can't give you any examples because I don't know. Forget about it. But you get the point. I'm just giving you a biblical basis. You with me there? Really? So even though we can document miracles were taking place in the 2nd century, and 3rd century, and 4th century, and even Lee Strobel just came up with Case for Miracles, documented medical miracles that even doctors say were miracles. That means those miracles didn't occur because the canon stopped. Was yeah, really Christ uh, the way? Exactly, my Pedro. That counts too. The woman with a bleeding disorder, Luke eight, Mark five, touched the tassels of Jesus's robe and she got healed. Okay, so that's the point. Anyway, just to let you know, do you want to be biblical? Do you want to let the Bible inform your theology and not tradition, even if people attack you? I just showed you biblically, Moses and Elijah came and spoke to people on earth. I just showed you biblically, God can use artifacts of people to confer blessings and graces. That's biblical. To my shame, I tried to explain these away years ago until I finally said, why? Why am I explaining them away? Why? What's the point? If it's biblical... Why do I need to deny it? What's wrong? And why am I fighting if it's in the Bible? Right? So hopefully I answered Matthew 16, 28. Did we get all that meat, Matthew 16, 28? Was that clear? So did I answer Matthew 16, 28? Now, I think I have to do a part two, God willing, because I'm not going to be able to finish both passages, Mark 13, 32, and Hebrews 1, 5. Okay? So which do you guys want me to address now? Let me explain what Mark 13, 32, and Hebrews 1, 5 happen to be. Okay? I will do part two, but I'm going to address one of the two last passages. Here. Mark 13, 32 is about Jesus not knowing the their hour, something I've discussed over and over again. I have articles on it. Hebrews 1.5 has to do with the beginning of the Son. When was Jesus begotten? And if someone is begotten, does that mean he didn't exist before he was begotten? Yeah, but Louisa, who's talking about you, sister? So wait, Louisa, you mean when Elisha's bones revived the dead man? Elisha was dead. He wasn't doing ministry anymore. So what about that, Louisa? Let's forget about Elisha. So Lisa, let's go with your logic. Elisha was dead. In fact, his body decayed. It was only bones. He wasn't ministering on earth anymore. So how could his bones confer life to a dead body? Lisa, help me understand that logic. So let's forget about the Elisha part, his bones. You know what it means that he was bones? His body had decayed. He had been dead for a while, right? Because it was only bones. How could the bones of a dead prophet who's no longer alive on earth doing ministry revive a dead body? Louisa. So do you want to answer that for me, sister? I'm just waiting. No, he wasn't begotten at the incarnation, Mike. Don't help me answer the question. Them bones, them bones, the beef bones. So Louisa, what proof do you have that those signs were for there and stopped? Since you believe in the Bible, quote a verse that says, once the Bible's complete, that's it, it's done with. You can't tell me that you follow the Bible 
and then use an argument that's not in the Bible to deny what the Bible teaches. So what verse do you have, Luisa, to show those miracles stop? It was only for that time. What is your biblical basis? Right? Yeah, miracles are still happening now. So, Luisa, are you a biblicist? If you're a biblicist, don't argue without having a biblical basis to back up your claim because you're contradicting your position. You say you follow the Bible, but then you're saying, well, those miracles for, were for that time. Where did the Bible say that? Where did the Bible say it was only for that time, but these miracles won't be something that God can do and does till Jesus returns? And Louisa, do you want me to give you a biblical basis that miracles will not stop until Jesus returns? Do you want me to now? Guys, do you want the biblical proof that miracles do not stop until Jesus returns? Now, let me ask you a question, though. How many of you believe Revelation is still future? That it's not referring to events that were fulfilled in 70 AD, but it's referring to the future. Louisa, do you believe Revelation is referring to the future? Christ returning to the earth? Do you? Now you're in trouble, Louisa, and I say this in love. What do you do, Louisa, in Revelation 11, where God will raise up two men to prophesy for three and a half years, 1,260 days, and they will do signs and wonders such as bring fire from heaven, and then they will be killed, and then they will be raised physically three and a half days later and be taken physically in a cloud and taken to heaven. What about those miracles, Revelation 11? That's going to happen right around the appearance of the Antichrist. What do you do with that? But I thought those miracles were only for the time of Paul, Louisa. Jesus is king. I'm going to answer yes. What kind of question is this? Does Revelation contradict Matthew 24? Definitely contradicts it. So stop being a Christian. Why would you ask me that question, dude? What kind of questions do you ask? Okay, so Luisa, what biblical basis do you have? Miracles were only for the time of the apostles. When Revelation 11 says, if you believe it's future, two men will arise. Doing miracles such as bringing fire from heaven and prophesying for three and a half years, be killed and be raised physically three and a half days later and physically ascend into a cloud. And that's referring to the future. Long after the apostles died, long after the canon was closed. So where did you get the signs ended with the ministry of the apostles, Louisa? Guys, don't help me to help her. Don't help me to help her. Guys, just let me work with her. What is Zena saying that she's saying? Uh, Zena, thank you for being Louisa's attorney. Can you show me where it says those miracles are specific to apostles? So if you're not an apostle, you can't do those miracles. Do you want me to show you, Zena? Louisa's attorney or public defender, because I don't think she pays you to represent her, that 1 Corinthians 12 says miracles are assigned to different members of the body of Christ, not just to apostles. 1 Corinthians 12, 28 to 31. But thank you, attorney general, for representing your client who didn't ask to be represented. But thank you, sister. Just, you know, you're Chaldean. <laughs> Choose Jesus and Razzas will tell you. You're Chaldean. You can't help it. But 1 Corinthians 12, 28 to 31, okay? Let me answer that objection. 1 Corinthians 12, 28 to 31. And God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondary prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles. Now, can you show me where the miracles of the apostles are unique to them? You just read, there are miracle workers besides the apostles and teachers. Gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Now watch this, Zena. Defense attorney, 2931, are all apostles? No. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Are all workers of miracles? No. Have all the gifts of healing? No. Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? No. But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. Where did you get the miracles of the apostles are unique to them? 
where it just says some will be given that specific grace of doing miracles, miracles like the apostles, but it's not given to all. So, Lisa, can we stop arguing unbiblically? Because your argument is not based on Scripture. It goes against Scripture because if you follow the Bible, you have to prove your case from the Bible. Where is the proof? Exactly, Louisa, you are. In fact, Louisa, let me give you further proof. First of all, I gave you Revelation 11, right, Louisa? You believe those two who will prophesy. That's future, right? That's future, right? Just Is that future? So then how can the secessionists be right if Revelation tells you right before Christ returns, there'll be miracles that we don't even have a record of the apostles doing? Do you have a record of an apostle bringing fire down from heaven? Elijah did in 2 Kings chapter 1. Okay? So how can you be a secessionist if you leave Revelation as future? Secondly, let's go to 1 Corinthians 1, 7 to 8. Chapter 1, verses 7 to 8. Exactly, Mike A.D. Too much Justin Peters and Todd Friel. Forget them. Okay? 1 Corinthians 1, 7 to 8. Guys, read with me. 1 Corinthians 1, 7 to 8. Read. Please read with me. So that ye come behind in no gift. I'm going to show you what the Greek word is in a minute. You lack no gift, and these gifts are yours for how long? Waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Did you catch it? You lack no gift until when? You have all the gifts you need, and the, these gifts are yours until when, folks? Until when? So when Jesus returns Sidney Bellow in Revelation, that's metaphorical. He's not going to return, actually. Until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Last time I checked, Jesus hasn't shown up. So if Paul is right and the coming of Jesus refers to him physically coming down from heaven to judge the living and the dead. If Paul is right, does that mean the gifts that God gave to the churches at Paul's time, which include miracles and healings, are those gifts still with me today and will be with Christians till Jesus comes? If Paul is right, Louisa, and everyone else? Okay, well, let me show you something here. Wait, wait, let me show you what the word gift is. Last time I checked, Jesus hasn't come. And Paul says, you lack no gift until the coming of our Lord Jesus. You mean, Paul, all the gifts in, in 1 Corinthians, the miracles and so forth. Those miracles, those gifts will be with us till Christ comes? Yep. Okay, Paul. But here, guys, don't take my word for it. Click here. You know what the word for gift is? Luis and everyone else? You know what the word for gift is? There it goes. Guys, there it goes. I gave you the link three times. Louisa, guess what the word is? Charismata, uh, charismati. That's where we get the word charismatic gifts. So Paul in Greek said, you lack no charismati, no charismatic gift until the Lord Jesus comes. But there it is. Don't take my word for it. Guys, I don't know what you're reading. Click on it and see. The word gift is charismati. That's where you get charismatic. So what did Paul say? You lack no charismatic gift until the Lord Jesus comes. So now, Lisa, make your case biblically. Show that those miracles cannot be done and are not done today. Just because you have clowns and deceivers and tools of Satan shaming the Lord and the scriptures, doing things that are abomination and passing them off as these gifts, that doesn't mean genuine 
Bonafide miracles and gifts do not exist just because you have abuses of them. When will it fail, Louisa? You're still not getting me. Al Masihu Akbar, Al Masihu Akbar. Louisa, it says it will not fail until the perfect comes. And according to Paul, who is that perfect that comes? Louisa. First Corinthians 13, 8 to 10. Louisa, you're kidding me. You know, even according to that, you have to believe that the gifts were still operative until the 400s. You know why? Because the canon was still being debated for centuries. So when exactly did the gift stop, Louisa? Let's go with that argument, the canon. When was the canon closed? When did the church realize the canon was closed and what the canon was? I know, Luisa. I'm helping you, sister. Don't be, don't be sensitive, sister. You're my sister, and you know I'm, I'm passionate. I'm a Syrian. I'm angry at the world. And when I got Chaldeans denying they're a Syrian, they get me angry. And when Truth Defender shows up, a Moriite, I get even more angry. Okay, Luisa, when did the church recognize what the canon was? So that was closed centuries later. Centuries later. So even if I go with that argument, that means you must believe these miracles will still present for hundreds of years after Christ. But then secondly, Louisa, here's the problem with that interpretation. First Corinthians 13 verses 8 to 10. Because I know Louisa from Paltok. I'm starting to think, cool, uh, Vinan, you may be six years old playing with dolls. And I'm scared that Muhammad's cousin will come and marry you. Okay, 1 Corinthians 13, 8 to 10. Okay, watch here. 1 Corinthians 13, 8 to 10. Okay, read with me, guys. So you're scared about a Muhammad's cousin marrying you, Kulavainen? <laughs> okay, Louisa, please read. We went off topic again. Oh, boy. All right, 1 Corinthians 13, 8 to 10. Louisa, read. Charity, which is the Greek word for love, Never faileth, but where there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, we only know partly, and we prophesy in part. We don't know everything completely. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away with. So, Louisa, you think with the closing of the canon, now we know completely? Now we have perfect knowledge? Now let's read verses 11 to 12. Because when the perfect comes, we won't know in part anymore. We will know completely. Verses 11 to 12. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 11 to 12. Okay, Louisa, read. When I was a child, I spake as a child, even the truth of under still a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Now watch, verse 12. For now we see through a glass darkly, dimly. We don't see clearly. But then face to face, now I know in part, but then shall I know, even so also am I known. I will know as I'm known. Okay, Louisa, Paul says when the perfect comes, we will know completely and perfectly, not partly and dimly. Which Christian can you point to to show me he knows the Bible perfectly and completely, not dimly, not partially, now that the canon is closed? Show me. Which Christian now sees clearly, not dimly, and knows perfectly, not partially? But that's what will happen when the perfect comes. That's the context, Luis. I'm giving you the context. I'm not making up. When the perfect comes, we will see clearly, no more dimly. You said it's the canon. So that means now that the canon is closed, all of us see clearly and perfectly. I don't think so. Because if we did, we wouldn't have all these denominations, Catholics, Orthodox, Assyrian Church of the East, and the varieties of Protestantism. I don't think so, Louisa. Yes, Umberto. Jesus is the perfect that makes everything perfect complete when he comes. Let me give you corroborating proof for it. Let's go to 1 John 3, verses 2 to 3. 
I just answered it, Luisa. Who do you think the perfect is? Who do you think the perfect is? Who is it that's perfect and will perfect all things and make us complete? Who do you think, Luisa? Exactly. You wouldn't need teachers. Yes, Jesus. And that goes back to 1 Corinthians 1, 7 to 8, Luisa. You lack no gift until the coming of our Lord Jesus. See, you got it. When our Lord Jesus comes, that's when we will be perfect because he will complete us. He is the perfection that comes to make us perfect. Now it goes back to 1 Corinthians 1, 7 to 8. You lack no gift until the coming of our Lord Jesus. Thank you, Louisa. You got it. 1 John 3, verses 2 to 3. 1 John 3, verses 2 to 3. Read with me. Beloved, Louisa, read this with me. Beloved, 1 John 3, 2 to 3. Now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. We're sons of God, but we're destined to become something. We're destined to be changed into something. What are we destined to change into? But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. See, now I see partly, but when he comes, I will see him as he is, and I'll be like him. That's theosis. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Did you catch it, Luisa? When he comes, I will see him as he is, and I will be like him. Theosis. I'll become morally incorruptible like him, and physically indestructible and deathless like he is. Yes, Luisa, you won't be hindered by sin, by tradition, by the world, by Satan, because all of that will be eradicated. Your mind will now be made whole. Your desires will be made pure. And your sight will be perfected to see things as they are. Not the way you think they are. Look at this guy. Leviticus 19.34. Because again, you speak in ignorance. Theosis doesn't mean we will be gods. In the sense that I will be almighty, all-knowing. Theosis means I partake in the divine nature in this extent. God is morally incorruptible, I become morally incorruptible. God is deathless, I become deathless because of his grace. And he just posted a verse. It's 2 Peter 1, verse 4, not 2, 4, brother. It's okay, Orthodox defense. You're trying to be like me, but be better than me. 2 Peter 1, verse 4, not 2, 4. You need to repent for misquoting scripture like that. 2 Peter 1, verse 4. Okay, here it goes. 2 Peter 1, verse 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. Partakers of the divine nature. And when you partake of the divine nature, guess what happens? You escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. Romans 8, 29. Romans 8, 20. Jade, I'm giving you the verses to confirm. This tradition is anchored in Scripture again. Romans 8, 29. Heirs means you share in Christ's inheritance, Sydney. Whatever Christ owns, you share in it because he gives it to you out of his love and grace. If the earth is his, the earth is yours. Romans 8, 29. For when he, for whom he did foreknow, watch, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. Wow. You will conform to the image of Christ. You'll be like Christ. Not in the sense that you'll be uncreated. You can't be uncreated. You're a creature. Not in the sense that you'll be all-knowing. You can't. You're a creature. All-powerful. But you will conform to the image of Christ in this way. You'll be morally incorruptible like him and deathless like him. 1 Corinthians 15 45 to 49. Lord willing, I have to do part two tomorrow. I can't do Mark 13, 32, Hebrews 1, 5 tonight. We're done after this. 1 Corinthians 15, 45 to 49. Reign means to rule. R-E, 
IGN means to rule. Your reign means your rulership. You rule. And what happened to them, Kula Vanayin? Man, you better change your name. I'm going to block you for that foolish name. Kula Vanayin? What are you, Wolverine? 1 Corinthians 15, 45 to 49. Read with me. Read with me, folks. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit, a life-giving spirit. Jesus is God, and his divine nature is spirit, and he gives life. Right? Now watch. How be it that was not first, which is spiritual. The one that came first was the one from the dust. That came first, the fleshly Adam, the earthly Adam, not the spiritual Adam, the one from heaven. Okay? That's what it's saying here. But that which is natural, soulish, the one who came from dust. After that came that which is spiritual, the spiritual Adam. The Lord of heaven who became man to become the last Adam. Now watch, guys. Read 47 with me, please. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. Now watch, 48 to 49. 48 to 49. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. In other words, if you're from the first Adam, he's of earth, you're earthy. You're soulish. You're sinful. You'll die like he did. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. If you belong to Christ, you'll be like him. He's heavenly. You're heavenly. He can never die. You'll never die. Right? Now watch here. Verse 49. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, the first Adam, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. There you go. That's theosis. That's theosis. You get it? I'm going to be like Jesus in his glorified humanity, which is made immortal, incorruptible, deathless. And I'm going to be like God in that I'll be morally incorruptible. I will never be able to sin ever again because I'll be transformed. If Jesus can sin, so can I. God forbid, it's blasphemy to say Jesus can sin. Neither will you be able to sin because you will then be holy like the Father is holy. Exactly, Ariel. 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. Clear? Earthy means of the earth. Louisa, did you get the answers to your questions? Because you've been praying, right? You've been asking the Spirit to bring you to the right teachers, to challenge you, to make you uncomfortable, to make you think out of your comfort zone. Okay. Lord Jesus willing, part two tomorrow. I'll try to be on 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time where we're going to do part two because i got to finish Mark 13, 32 and Hebrews 1, 5. No, Jesus is mighty God because angels were given the power to choose like Adam. Do I have to explain that, Jesus is mighty God? Can, can you tell me where you live, Jesus is mighty God? Because I really want to visit you because I really want to lay hands on you to bless you. Heal! Heal! Bless you, okay? God willing... Lord Jesus willing, tomorrow, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. But folks, realize we are in a spiritual battle. Folks, if you understand the satanic onslaught on me, why? Satan is going to attack those who are in the front line who are most visible glorifying Christ. That means the David Woods, the Ravi Zacharias, and me, and not that I'm on their level. He'll either attack me because I haven't seen my daughter since June. And when they call me, my heart breaks and I'm dying because they want to see me. They want to hold me. They want to kiss me and they want to be with me every day. And until Jesus does a miracle, there's nothing I can do. Or he'll attack me by knowing what triggers me and having people who claim to be Christian challenging me or accusing me of being a heretic for the positions I take. And what that does, it either gets me angry and I sin in my anger or I get depressed. And when I get depressed, then my flesh kicks in and I struggle with sinful desires. I need your prayers. My daughters need your prayers. And please fast for us too. That Jesus will crucify my flesh to overcome it. Not allow the devil to cause me to get angry or depressed. And to show me that he will keep my daughters safe. Provide for them as he provides for me to do this work till I die and that he'll bring them to me so I can hug them again, kiss them again, pray with them and put them to sleep. I miss them and they miss me. Please pray. If you believe God has called me to ministry, pray the Lord will do a miracle because, folks, I'm human. I'm a sinner. 
I have sinful tendencies. And I pray this. If God wants me to remain celibate, to crucify my sinful passions so I won't burn. But if God wants me to marry, to show me that godly woman that's filled with the spirit that will be my partner to serve the Lord, work with me, not against me, to serve the Lord till we die. And if that's what he wants, to reveal her sooner than later. If not, give me the grace to be celibate. I'm okay with it. But pray because it is a battle. If you guys are doing the work of the Lord, I promise you, you will be attacked. You will be attacked and discouraged because Saint wants to take you out of the fight. But he that is in us is greater than he who is in the world. And by the blood of Jesus, we overcome him. And plead the blood of Jesus upon yourselves, upon me and my daughters. Lord willing, tomorrow, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, part two. I love you guys for the sake of Jesus. And my, my Nubian pr princess, what's up, Magdalene? My Nubian princess, Irie, Irie, come back to Jamaica. What's old is what's new. All right, anyway, God bless you. Take care. Christ is risen, risen indeed.